Well, hey there, all you sexy rock and roll college students, martial arts band members. Hi, yeah. hi, 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 sweetie. It's time for another high kicking episode of Red Movie Rama. This is another hot number for sure because we're going to be talking about the 1987 cult classic. Miami Connection. Uh, hold on, Skippy. Every time you say cult classic, I'm, it just baffles me because it's never a classic. Oh no, this is this is definitely a a classic, a cult classic. The Wizard of Oz. Now that's a classic. This this cult thing is just nonsense. Well, you're not really gonna have to worry about it because again, I'm gonna have to ask you guys to kind of you know go hang out somewhere else because I'm gonna have another special guest on the now, show. Now wait a minute, Skippy. I mean, you're bringing these. Are you even doing a scan on these people to make sure that they're you know like legit people? Yeah, I mean these are these are people that I talk to pretty regularly. Well, I think I think you ought to let me like do background checks on people and stuff because you're making me nervous with all this. Relax, Aswell. Everything's gonna be cool. And this one specifically is very cool because it's Mike Merriman. Mike. Mike who? It's Mike Merriman. He's from, you know, Evil Episodes and uh, No More Room in Hell. Th- that's the name of these shows? That that's th- that sounds dangerous. Well, you know, yeah, these, these shows are about uh, subject matter that can be a little dangerous, just like Miami Connection. Well, I tell you what, you, you guys, if you feel safe, you just go right ahead, you do your show. I'm going to go back. And and watch some more episodes of Columbo. No, okay, well that that'll work out fine. We'll we're gonna have a blast. So uh, take it away, Rick. Miami Connection is a 1987 martial arts crime movie directed by Y.K. Kim and Park Woo Sang. A multinational martial arts rock band, Dragon Sound embark on a wreck wave of crime-crushing justice clamping down on Florida's narcotic trade. Starring Y.K. Kim as Mark. You don't frighten me at all. Marie Smith as Jim. Oh my God! Kathy Collier as Jane. He's just a friend. Vincent Hirsch as John. Sorry about your brother, Jane. Angelo Gennati is Tom. Hey, wasn't this guy in Hall and & Oates? And a whole bunch of other people that don't really matter, but you know what does matter? There's ninjas riding motorcycles. Yeah, it's that kind of movie. Back to you, Rick. All right, folks. Ready to jump into this movie, and I have to introduce my guest here, and he's been calling me up talking about wanting to do this movie somewhere. And I think we found a, finally found a way to do this. And it's none other than podcaster extraordinaire, Mr. Mike Merriman. What's up, brother? Hey, man. How's it going? This is a long time coming. Man, we've been kicking this around for, I don't know, six years, maybe, something like that, where we've kind of crossed paths. And mm-hmm. earlier, we were trying to figure out we have done something together. We just couldn't remember what. But it doesn't matter because... We're going to talk about this crazy movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's nuts. It's it's oh man, it's it's hard to explain because there's so much going on in this. There's it, sometimes there's a little too much going on. It seems like, but uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get into all that. <laughs> Absolutely. So let, let's talk about. Let's see. Like I said, podcast extraordinaire. I've got wrote down, and you correct me because I'm going to miss some. But you got fresh cuts out there, right? Mm-hmm. You got no more room in hell. Correct. And you've got Burning for Springwood, which is about the Nightmare on M Street series that came out back in the day. Yep, Freddy's so Nightmares. There, there's, yeah, yeah. So there's three. So what? What am I missing? <laughs> uh, you pretty much have it covered as far as like shows that I am like the regular host on. Sometimes I'll show up on um, other places like Twenty Two Shots of Moods and Horror. Um, yeah, I. I did a show called Theme Warriors for a while, which technically didn't really end. We've just been on like a crazy hiatus because four four hosts with their own shows, their own lives, and just mm-hmm. that kind of you know that kind of happens. But um, I'm holding out hope that eventually that one will 
find its way back. But other than that, you know, evil episodes back in the day when I used to cover TV yep, horror. Evil episodes. The, yeah, that's at least what a few years retired now. But um, you you got the main ones. You you did your research well. <laughs> Not bad for five minutes of, of cramming. So, yeah. but yeah, man, the, theme warriors and evil episodes is probably where I, I knew you first from because I think mm-hmm. those shows were happening when I was first cutting my teeth in the podcasting world. And yeah, man, you guys were like the superstars to me. So this is this is cool, man. I'm enjoying this already. But uh, we have got to put on our high waders and go to Miami <laughs> for some Miami connection. <laughs> the streets so, of Miami. So I have to ask <laughs> to the streets of Miami. I have to ask because you know I'm thinking the background that you and I both have, and I thought, man, we'll find some crazy cool horror flick because that's kind of our stomping ground. But no, you 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 brought Miami Connection. So I'm I'm curious. <laughs> when did you first see this? And and. I'm, obviously, you love it because you want to talk about it, but is this something recent, or have you been holding on to this one for a while? I mean, I, I've seen it, you know, years and years ago, um, probably on, like, you know, Cinemax 2, HBO 3, one of, one of the, the uh, added premium channels in the middle of the night, you know, when they have nothing better to show. And... Yeah. Uh, I saw it again recently, and I was like, man, you know, this would be a perfect movie to talk about on a show, but mo- most of the shows I do are horror-specific, but it's kind of weird because in that horror podcasting community, you kind of have, like, the portion of hosts that almost watch exclusively horror movies because they just watch so many of them, and then you have the, the ones like me who are, yes, I primarily watch a lot of horror, but I still like watching all genres and I just don't have many outlets for talking right. on horror. So anytime I have a chance to, you know, that's one of the reasons I was doing theme warriors or when I like to show up other places and get in some other genres. And this is, uh, I guess a hybrid genre of a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's exactly what this podcast is. And, and well, hell means kind of the same thing too, because we didn't want to be locked into any one thing. So you're, you're in the mm-hmm. right sprite, right place, bro. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I I had just recently seen this. So this is one that I just caught just a few years ago. And it <laughs> as bad as it is, it never gets old. <laughs> if I'd seen this when I was like 15, I would have been all about this movie. Because a rock band fighting drug-dealing ninjas on motorcycles, I'm sold. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and what always struck me is, like, the beginning of the movie, it starts off, like, fairly standard. Like, you, I'm talking, like, the opening scene. You mm-hmm. think, okay, it's going to be a movie about, I guess, maybe these Cuban drug lords versus these ninjas. And then right after this big, epic, you know, drug deal gone bad scene, we immediately cut to, like, a karate band or karate rock and roll band at a concert. And it's like, well, what do these guys have to do with anything we just saw? Um, so this movie <laughs> tends to throw different things at you, as as we'll get into. Um, right. But, yeah, it, it's just one of those things. I love showing people this for the first time because they probably think they know what they're in for with that opening scene. And it just kind of veers off different paths. And, yeah, it goes places. So, yeah, man, I mean, you, you pretty much kicked it off here. You get a, a, a moniker that comes at the beginning that says, Somewhere in Miami. And it's basically, like you said, a, a drug deal that's going wrong because uh, there's ninjas that show up on motorcycles, which mm-hmm. I thought the whole point of being a ninja was, you know, secrecy and, and, you know, being able to sneak up on stuff. But, you know, it's basically a motorcycle gang of ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... Uh... They are there to uh, steal some money and some drugs. I guess they are, you know, they want to establish themselves on the Cuban territory of southern Florida down in Miami. <laughs> yeah. They're like ninja Robin Hoods, right? Because they steal the drugs from the drug dealers and then they sell the drugs themselves. And <laughs> that's how they support their ninja habit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the cool ninja costumes and weapons. <laughs> But like you said, man, I mean, it's got to, I have to admit, the opening scene is pretty much on par with any B 
B-grade action flick of the time, it's really not that bad. Yeah. And like you said, when you show it to people, they're like, okay, I kind of feel like I've seen this before, except it's, you know, motorcycle ninjas. But uh, then, like you said, it just kind of takes a left turn because after they <laughs> after they take the drugs, we go back to Ninja headquarters and we meet Yoshido, which is the ninja that's dressed in white. Mm-hmm. And he's the leader of this group. And he's like, hey, y'all got the drugs, but where's the money? So they're like, don't. They forgot to grab the money. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if the, I guess there's no code of the ninja. I guess they they do want money too, so it's not just about the drugs. But ah, oh, the the money they left out the money. What are you gonna do? You know, you get half the job complete. So that's why we need, I guess we need the rest of the movie. <laughs> Yeah, which ironically is where Yoshido and a dude named Jeff with one of the worst haircuts in modern cinema history uh, meet up together at a club where a band called Dragon Sound is playing and they're live on stage. And before we even started recording this, you were already saying that stupid song is already stuck in your head, which if you know this movie, you know the song, Friends Forever... (laughs) <laughs> it's t- <laughs> it gets stuck in your head probably more than probably a song from any other movie. But yeah, they're up here jamming on stage. The crowd's yeah, going wild. The crowd the crowd loves it. It's a lit show in in Miami for Dragon Sound, and I mean topped off by the one guy that has bears a striking resemblance to what is it Kyle Oates of Hall Notes? <laughs> uh, John Oates, yeah. Oh, John Oates. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, oh my god. Like that's all I could think of when he first came on the when he oh, first yeah. came on the screen. I was like, "What?" Yeah, absolutely. And and the, ironically, I, I believe he was it was him and the drummer. No, not the drummer. It was him and one other guy that were actually musicians and the rest of them obviously couldn't play at all. So mm-hmm. <laughs> you could tell some of them were just holding the instrument very uncomfortably like, "Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here, but hey, we're rocking out." It's uh it's catchy and it's shot well, but you can tell that uh, yeah, this is not a normal situation for these people whatsoever. But they're rocking out, and then Yoshido looks up and goes, "Hey, Jeff, ain't that your sister on the stage?" And he's like, "Yeah, I don't know what she's doing here." <laughs> yeah. So apparently, she's now a member of the band for some reason. <laughs> I guess so, and it, it, it deserves to be said too. This is like not your typical like thirty second like clip of a of a live performance like they pretty much play like the full length song it's the whole song man like it keeps going (laughs) yeah and you're just waiting for it to end yeah you 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 expect like your quick cut like okay we got the you know a lot of movies they'll just like do the point of like okay you just need to know they're like a karate rock band so we'll give you like your 30 second performance but this one's like no we're gonna um extend this scene out all the while they're playing and other stuff starts going on (laughs) to the point that they're actually even like kicking and stuff on the stage while they're playing i mean it's just like (laughs) okay and, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder about this relationship with Yoshido and Jeff because these guys are obviously in a business together, drug dealing. But is it standard for drug dealers to like know each other's family members? Like, hey, ain't that your sister? I'm like, how would this guy know? I mean, I don't know. We don't get a backstory of the relationship with the two. But I thought, how weird that this random leader of a ninja group knows this dude's sister all of a sudden. <laughs> so I don't know. Just yeah. that was kind of odd. Yeah, he, he he has a lot of concern for the fact that she's in a rock band. Like, it's the yeah. worst thing in the world. Like, you're a drug dealer, and you're concerned that she's in a rock band? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just killed out a whole gang, a, a mob gang, you know, uh, with, with swords and stuff. But, hey, she's in a rock band. That's off limits, man. <laughs> <laughs> and we find out that the whole band is pretty much 30-year-old college students. Uh, I don't know... Who came up with the idea of them being college students? But they're a little old for that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, because I think we're yeah right after we get the scene of them driving it or yeah the, the scene with the college with them and it's just, you're right. It's like what what classes are are they finishing up degrees they 
they failed to finish when they started their rock career and they they finally decided hey let's go back and get those final credits or what because uh, it's it's really odd because the, they're obviously older than anybody there and they're hanging out together you, they act like they're a younger group of guys but they're not mm-hmm. needless to say it comes down to the fact of the bass player in the band whose name is Johnny is knocking boots with uh, Jeff's sister uh, Jane and um uh, they're hanging out at the college and, and walking together. And uh, Jane decides it's time for him to meet Jeff, which is possibly the worst idea that could ever happen in this movie. <laughs> yeah, she, does she, she doesn't seem to know her brother very well because, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. And immediately he, just, he wants to fight. <laughs> well, she even says, well, he's, you got to watch him, though. He, he's really jealous. And when they get there, he's like, who's this guy? And he goes, oh, he's a friend. A friend! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, he's very angry over some friendship there. Like that, I, yeah, I remember cracking up at his reaction to a friend. Like, wow, oh, his acting. I, is I, I hate. Terrible. I hate what would have happened if she said it's my boyfriend. And jealous? How? I'm like, that's that's your sister. Yeah. How are you jealous? <laughs> yeah, he's a little infatuated with his sister, you know. But anyways, that's for a different movie. <laughs> The whole story behind this movie is this character named Mark, who is played by a Taekwondo specialist, right? He's a teacher. And this was his idea of getting the message of Taekwondo out there, which, you know, he's trying to do the Bruce Lee thing of making Taekwondo the biggest thing in the planet. And needless to say, we will talk a lot about the character Mark, who pretty much is the worst actor in this movie except for Jeff. So at this point we get Jeff and Mark confronting each other because right after he said after Jeff says a friend, he basically punches <laughs> the bass player for no reason. <laughs> and then the rest of the band shows up and come just on in man, time, Mar- just in time they when, show up. When Mark shows up and goes, "You don't frighten me at all. At all." <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, there's a reason they they were all like not um, singing in the rock band because the, a lot of these actors are better left like with no speaking parts. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, his his lines are just they're just terrible. Hit between him and Jeff, man, it, that's ooh, it's some rough acting in this. And, and I will say though, Jeff. The guy playing Jeff is the worst actor in the whole movie, but you know, needless to say, he's he's still a pretty good bad guy. <laughs> uh, you know who gives him a run for his money? And I'm not trying to get way ahead of ourselves, but the the one dude that's Jim. looking for his dad, his Jim, the, yeah. the guy who plays the dad, <laughs> was freaking oh, horrible. <laughs> we'll we'll get we'll get more to that later, but I just had to like nominate him oh, yeah. for one of the tops too. <laughs> Yeah, we do, because right now we, what we got to do is go back to the club, and this is where the angry band shows up. <laughs> I love this scene, man, because here's a band that's coming in there. They're mad because they got fired because they brought in Dragon Sound, and the club owner kicks the whole band's butt by himself. I mean, <laughs> it turns into a big martial arts fight, and obviously when you look at these guys... They don't know martial arts. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, that's another thing about this movie. There's a lot of non-martial artists doing martial arts in this movie, and it's very obvious. <laughs> I yeah. can't believe the emphasis of how important it is to be a rock band at this time in this movie. Because <laughs> everything rotates about getting Dragon Sound out of that club. I mean, that's really the nuts and bolts of this thing. Uh, we cut to Jeff's, or Jeff's at Yoshido's place now. <laughs> And again, Yoshido says, so how's your sister? It's like, dude, back off my sister, would you? I mean... <laughs> yeah, I think he's like the jealous one, too, because yeah. he, he, won't, he won't let go of uh, the sister. And just like I said, it's brought up, we need to get rid of that band so we can control the area. And I'm going, they're college kids playing in the band. They have no idea what your business is or anything. So... How are they affecting your drug dealing business at all? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I don't understand why they're even adversaries necessarily to uh, Dragon Sound. Like, what other other than the fact that 
dude's sister is in the band. Like, what is their connection? Yeah, right. And speaking of that, it cuts to Dragon Sound playing another song for 45 minutes. And they're playing a <laughs> song called Against the Ninja. Like, that's not uh, metaphorically enough for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and this scene, man, I don't know if you've paid attention. Now, go back, go back and check it out. But the crowd clapping to the song is a loop, and it gets off from the music terribly, but it just keeps going. <laughs> so, the, I mean, it's like a group clap thing, and they did not sync this thing up whatsoever. It is. I just crack up when I hear it, man, because, you know, the music background thing just makes me go, oh, gosh, man. You know, there's some things you have to put a little effort into, and this one they did not. But you know what? It doesn't matter. We're singing against the ninja. And then after the gig, Dragon Sound (laughs) gets in their car, heading home, I guess. And then they get in a street fight with the other band that just got their butts kicked by the owner of the club. And the leader of the band even says it. Yeah, we just got our asses kicked, and it's your fault, and now we're going to kick your butts. And I'm like... How does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah, it's like when they were writing this movie out, they're like, well, we got to put fight scenes in here, but we don't know how to segue into them. So let's just come up with the most idiotic reasoning that, you know, it's nonsensical that half these fights are even happening in the first place. Right. But yeah, it's it's in the middle of town. It's dark. And there's like four guys against... 50. I mean, it's not only the band, but it's like they're diehard fans, too, I guess. Which, uh, you know, it's it's Redneck Station, really, when you look at it. They're, they're a pretty rough rough and toothless-looking bunch. But, yeah, there's uh, obviously parts of Miami I've never seen or heard of, because half this movie takes place in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, you get another pretty good action sequence here, and uh, they end up getting back home. And everybody's safe and sound because, you know, everybody likes to just throw down and go home and say, yeah, that was fun, and let's go back to writing songs for our next gig. And this is where we get Jim's getting his first letter, which I don't know if you realize this or not, but every time Jim gets a letter, he's about to take a shower. (laughs) (laughs) He's got the towel over his shoulder, his pants are kind of pulled down, his underwear is showing, and that's when... Uh, John says, hey, you, you got a letter here. And he opens it up. There's some <laughs> some dialogue here, man, that is uh, probably the most famous scene from this movie is Jim's dialogue about looking for his father. Yeah. And, we, get, we get about halfway into the scene, and all I'm thinking sitting there watching is, like, why is this um, story arc even in this movie like well, I, I don't I, unless like you know the, the writers were like well we have to give everybody some type of like side story or something because I don't understand the purpose of this at all and I guess to their credit they at least follow through on it because you know some movies are so terrible that they introduce stuff like this and it just never follow up on it now, <laughs> right. now the follow ups we'll get to those later but gosh <laughs> Yeah, it's it's the whole thing because I think it's because of this part too. Because after he he has the meltdown of, I never saw my father again. <laughs> well, Mama and it, find him. I mean, and, and he's just he, ripping it up. Wasn't he upset too? Because like, I thought he said something at the beginning, like, "Oh, everyone else like doesn't." Is like an orphan or doesn't have a dad, but I actually do. And like he felt bad because he actually had a dad out there somewhere that he just didn't know. So he he, he was like yeah. he felt guilty. Yeah, that's the great thing because Mark goes, "I did not know you had a father. I thought we were all orphans." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> Yeah, like what is okay? Like why? Why is that introduced? Like what significance is that? I mean, is that what made the band get together? Is because you were all martial arts freaks that didn't have parents? I mean, maybe like yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe if the band's name would have been like Dragon Orphans or something, it would have had some significance. <laughs> but it. <laughs> and this is where it cuts away to where the band that just got beat up twice in one day shows up at Jeff's redneck training dojo, and uh, man. There's this place is so full of Leonard Skinner fans. <laughs> it's a wonder you can find a door. And uh, 
the band shows up. They need to talk to Jeff. And this has got to be the most ridiculous. I keep saying this every after every line we talk about. <laughs> This one takes the cake, though, man, because the band leader, after he's got his butt kicked and his guys come in, they got bandages on their face and on their nose, talks to Jeff and says, look, I need you to get rid of Dragon Sound so I can get my old job back. And if you get rid of them, I'll join up with you, and any money I make is yours. And I'm going, wait a minute. (laughs) Isn't the whole point of having the gig is so you can make money, but you're willing to get your job back and play for free because you're going to give all your money to Jeff because they got Dragon Dragon. That, that's not going to benefit you, dude. Some of these some of these things were not well thought out when getting put into a script. I mean, I, I played a lot of gigs where I didn't make any money, and I don't play them very often. So, you know, even in, in 87, supposedly when this was actually made, would anybody in the right mind do that? So, And I'm wondering, well, maybe he's thinking, I'll join up with you and sell drugs, and any money I make selling drugs is yours, but I'm going to keep my gig money, which still doesn't make any sense because you'd make a lot more selling drugs. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. it, does, it doesn't really matter because uh, we cut to Taekwondo practice. Yeah, a very long extended scene. <laughs> Way too long, man. I mean, how many times can you fake stab a guy and then, you know, yep, that was nice. Let's try it again. It goes on forever. Longer than the, the than the Friends Forever song. It just kind of keeps going. I was going to say, which is funny because, like, I think the entire running time of the movie is only an hour and 26 minutes. So the fact that yeah. there's, like, the extended concerts, the Taekwondo scene, some scenes that, like, probably if they got cut in half, it'd be, like, an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, the, the going to the beach scene, totally pointless. N- none of that has anything to do with any... So there's a lot of padding in this movie, for sure. But uh, with that being said, we come out of the Taekwondo practice, and the drummer is uh, kind of concerned and wants to quit playing the club because of Jeff. But then they talk about doing a, wor- a world tour. <laughs> uh, a world tour of Taekwondo places around the world, dojos around the world from each of their home countries and then rocking out somewhere. It's just so stupid. It's so stupid. (laughs) But anyways, the drummer is kind of wanting to call it quits here, which if you really pay attention, you don't see the drummer a whole lot more from this scene on through the rest of the movie. He just pops up every once in a while, but the rest of it kind of focuses around the other three. Um... Then it cuts to the guy that owns the restaurant, and there's a bunch of hoodlum guys in there, and they're going to walk out and not pay him for eating, and he goes out there and mops the floor with them while wearing a Mickey Mouse apron. And supposedly supposedly he's got a background in in martial arts as well, and all the guys like, man, you did a great job. You were punching that guy in the face. He goes... It's it's he's put he's pulling the Mr. Miyagi on us here, right? Oh, Taekwondo is not in your fist. It's in your heart and in your mind, you know. So it's you know, yeah, 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 we've heard that before. Make me a cheeseburger. And while they're in there eating, somebody sneaks up and puts a note on this incredible convertible that these guys ride around in all the time. But they left a note on the car saying, Hey, meet us at the railroad tracks and we're gonna settle all this. And I'm like, how would they know exactly wh- which railroad tracks they're talking about? You're you're in Miami. <laughs> that could be a lot of locations, dude. But apparently they know where they're going. And again, we get another pretty cool scene of, you know, driving out to the railroad tracks. People attacking them before they even get out of the car. And they're running around and punching and kicking people. Again, it's, it's pretty decent, middle-of-the-road, Jim Cotta-style martial arts here and uh, ironically the cops show up now I just want to emphasize here when they were in the middle of town I mean right in the middle of town no cops showed up when there's like 40 or 50 people fighting but they're going to show up out at (laughs) the railroad tracks which is totally out of town nobody around (laughs) I just I don't know I think they just had to have an excuse (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I was going to say, maybe these are like the famous fighting railroad tracks that like everybody in the area, that's like the designated fight spot, so the cops are just staking it out all the time. <laughs> you know what? That's a that's a very good point. It's kind of like, you know, at school you fought in the smoking area, right? Back in my day you did. If you're going to have a fight, it's going to be in the smoking area. That's right, people. There were smoking areas when I was in school. Live with it. Uh, but yeah, uh, the cops show up and everybody takes off. And then if that wasn't enough for you, then we get a biker bar montage where Yoshido and his gang, that are now not dressed up like uh, Nazis, they're dressed up just like regular bikers, show up at this biker bar. And folks, these are real bikers. This, these are not stand-in actors trying to be bikers. These are legit bikers at this bar because there's boobs being flopped out everywhere that you really don't want to see. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, A lot of toothless women, uh, a lot of rough guys that look like they haven't slept in four days. I think there's I think there's a lot of that in this movie where they just turn the camera on a bunch of locals at different places and we're like I guess they're in the movie. Yeah, I'm I'm betting there wasn't many permits for, that were issued for this movie. I think they just renegated. I, I think so. Uh, but anyways, this is a meeting spot for Jeff and Yoshido to get together and come up with another plan, I guess. But then uh, after you get done with this. 15 minute montage of nonsense we go back to uh, one day after school the next day after school this guy looks like chris farley and a bunch of wannabe gangsters kidnap tom which is the guitar player in the band john oates like you said <laughs> and uh they take him back to i guess the the redneck dojo and to celebrate chris farley <laughs> chris farley is teaching two rednecks how to pop and lock <laughs> <laughs> I like throughout all this, like none, like all these pe- the group that's supposedly in school. Like I don't see much studying or schoolwork ever being done. <laughs> no, no, no. It, but just the fact of just how disjointed this thing is, man. I mean, these guys are just hanging out, and no, man, you do your arms like this, you know. Um. <laughs> And then later later on that night, the rest of the band shows up, and now they've taken Tom. They've tied him up on this almost like a water tower or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's another setup for them to come around and do another round of butt kicking. But I'm telling you, man, Dragon Sound, they are the butt kickers, man. And they continue to show up. And these are drug dealers. These guys should have plenty of guns. <laughs> I mean... This really shouldn't be a fight. You're fighting, you know, four guys that are in college that are kind of goody two shoes. You should whip out one gun and this should be over. But no, it's a martial arts flick. So I get that, right? But it just seems funny that every time they show up, these guys get their butts kicked. And I love how they always throw back, you got to watch that Mark guy. He's a black belt in Taekwondo. And I'm like, how do they know he's a black belt in Taekwondo? (laughs) Nobody's yeah, I, ever said that. <laughs> you would think about like after the first ass kicking or two, they'd be like, "All right, we're not gonna beat him in a fight, so we're gonna have to up the ante." But no, not in this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go burn their house down or something, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, but needless to say, with all the butt kicking that's going on, Jeff falls to his death. So they save John Oates. <laughs> Take it back home, but Jeff has fallen and he's dead. And Yoshido is very angry now and he seeks revenge. And then we get another four minute training montage of the deadly Miami ninjas. Yeah, which, we, go, we go best of the best here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're breaking boards. We're setting boards on fire and breaking them. We're, you know, punching the air. All those things that really mean nothing when you get in a fight. And, uh,. <laughs> This is uh, this is the turning point for the film because this is where Jim gets his letter. Again, if you weren't listening earlier and you're listening now, Jeff is about to take a shower, and I guess he decides before he turns the water on, hey, I need to go check the mailbox. <laughs> so he walks outside with his pants halfway down, no shirt on, and a towel on his shoulder to check the mailbox. And, he's, and I'm glad he did because he finds a letter from his dad who's going to come to the airport and wants and wants to meet face to face and this yell that Jim does oh my god 
just imagine you're trying to track down your dad who, you know, walked out on you early in life. And when he finally reaches out, you have all this other stuff going on in your life, like fighting <laughs> drug lords. And, and your dad pops back up in your life right now. <laughs> Great time. I mean, we just we just pushed a guy off a ledge to his death. But don't worry about that. Your dad's coming back in town. <laughs> you know. <laughs> don't worry about the cops coming around asking questions. We got to go buy you a new suit because you're about to meet your dad. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna put everything else on hold because you got that letter. I, I love the fact that they come out and celebrate and they pick him up and just carry him around on their shoulders for a while, like. Like they're yeah, twelve. Like I mean, like the movie, like the movie's about to end because he got the letter. Like that's what it felt like. The way, yeah, the way they film it there, I was like, okay, like a little over dramatic for not the end of the movie. It, it does feel like the end of the movie, right? Like he'd go up and it'd be slow mo and it'd do a, a still shot, right? Of him like it's going, yeah, and it would end. But you're right. It just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, man, they take Jim out. They they compile all their money together. N- n- really, no speaking of what happened the night before, where Tom was tied up to a post and a guy was forcing beer down his throat, and we went up there and killed a bunch of guys. No, no mention of that. We got to go buy a suit and have a montage of getting <laughs> getting Jim a new suit. And then Jim shows back up at the house in his new suit, and then Jeff's sister shows up, and. She really doesn't seem that bothered that her brother is dead. <laughs> I mean, you know, her boyfriend John's like, "Hey, I'm I'm really sorry about your brother." Well, you know, you you did what you had to do, and I'm like, "What? That was your income. He was paying for your college. I mean, even though he was a grade A butthole, he was taking care of you for years because both of your parents had died, which he might have killed them. Who knows? But." Yeah. Uh, he might have been jealous of them too. You bought her presents. <laughs> <laughs> that that drug money's about to run out. She's gonna have to go get like a waitress job or something. <laughs> right, but yeah, she's not too bothered by this news at all about him being dead. But that doesn't slow the story down any at all because now John and Mark and Jim are on the way to the airport to pick up Jim's father. And then, out of nowhere, here comes the motorcycle ninjas. And I love the fact that they get on that bridge, and they look off in the distance, and they see, like, 25 motorcycles coming at them, and they go, "Uh uh-oh, ninjas. (laughs) (laughs) Like, that would be your reaction. (laughs) Yeah. The the known mode of transportation, motorcycles. (laughs) Uh, They were probably riding ninjas, so there you go. But, uh, yeah, just the fact of... Hey guys, get out of the way! We got to get to the airport. I mean, <laughs> t- totally dis- you know disfiguring the fact of that they're even ninjas to begin with. And you can see where this is going, folks. They uh, they attack them in the car and they jump out of the car and take off out in the wilderness. And the ninjas are chasing after. And then Jim gets his new suit ruined. Man, and one of the ninjas gets him and just kind of cuts him across the chest. Oh my gosh, man. When he gets hurt and then Mark comes up to him, Jim! 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 <laughs> it's like, dude, you're yelling in his face. That's not helping any at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he already knows he's hurt. You don't have to remind him. He knows. So, you know, Mark's dragging him through all this water and stuff, probably getting the cut infected instead of just letting him lay where he was. And then, dude, out of nowhere, we got to talk about this, man. John goes full Rambo mode on these guys, man. (laughs) The bass player. Mm -hmm. He has flipped his lid, man. And he finally gets his hand on a sword. And, dude, he goes to town. He's he's killing everybody. And luckily, nobody that's a good guy shows up because he probably would have killed them, too, because he's just killing anything that moves. <laughs> he's running around. He's got blood all over his face, slinging the sword around, chopping ninjas' heads off. I mean, <laughs> it's killer, man. <laughs> so him and Mark are in full mode. They're killing ninjas left and right. One injured ninja... Makes it all the way back to Yoshido and says, Master, everyone is dead. And then Yoshido just cuts that ninja's head off and starts laughing. 
<laughs> yes, it's a very hilarious occasion. But then we kind of get the final showdown that's between Yoshido and Mark. And it's kind of your typical fight where we're doing the swords for a bit, then we're going to break down to some knives. We're showing you some of the same moves that we showed during the Taekwondo montage where we're fighting each other. And he finally knocks the ninja down, and he I've got it wrote down here in my notes, never turn your back on a ninja. Why is that? Yeah, I. That's a good question. I, I'm trying to go back through like all the martial arts movies that I've watched and looked for lessons, and I don't know if I've ever got the lessons of never turn your back on a ninja. But right, uh, I mean it work, works on Freddy Krueger. Doesn't work on ninjas. Because <laughs> <laughs> what does a ninja do? He jumps back up with an extra little shank that he had in his shoe. And comes up and tries to stab you. And then, step by step, he, he shows you exactly the same thing he showed you earlier in Taekwondo training where he makes the guy miss with the knife and makes him stab himself. So, even at this point, we're saying that Mark didn't kill Yoshido. Yoshido killed himself. Yeah, I mean, I and, would say in general, if you're engaged in a fight, it's never good to turn your back on the person trying to fight you. <laughs> but I just didn't yeah. know it was exclusive to ninjas. <laughs> I mean, even Bob Barker knew that when he was fighting Happy Gilmore, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, you got to finish the job. So, uh, needless to say, now Yoshido is dead. And they rush Jim to the hospital. And then at the hospital, Jim's dad's there, who looks younger than Jim, just with spray-painted hair. Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. I was like, did they spray some grain there? Is he wearing just fake uh, prosthetics? Because he looks younger than Jim. <laughs> he kind of reminded me of the look of the the ter- one of the guys working in the terminal in Die Hard 2, if you can yeah. picture that in your mind. but And yeah. I was like, wow. He, it, I'm like, wait a minute. This guy had a – like, they look – way too close in age to be father and son <laughs> totally <laughs> agree man and as you know they, they just put some glasses on that'll make you look older <laughs> yeah <laughs> or i don't know cast somebody that's older <laughs> yeah i mean just find somebody i mean you've pulled everybody else out in this flick that don't know how to act why do you just stop here <laughs> i get yeah i guess they could not find old people in miami <laughs> go figure right right <laughs> <laughs> Well, the great news, folks, is that Jim is all right. He's hurting a little bit. He even tells us that when he meets his dad for the first time. And Jim and his father patch things up, and they're going to try to start a new life together. And not only that, the entire band is there now, except for the drummer. He's still not showing up. But uh, everybody's happy, and then they kind of walk off the screen together. (laughs) And then we get some message at the end about... Uh, until we until we can eliminate violence, there will never be any peace or something. Or we can, it's the only way we'll reach peace. It's, you know, I don't know, one of those things. <laughs> the only way to stop fighting is to stop fighting. <laughs> yeah, what a way to cap this is with like a, a nice little lesson that we were certainly waiting for. And so, but I love how it, it ends with this scene because it may. It makes it seem like the main arc of the movie was him finding his dad when that like started as just kind of like a little side plot, but like that's how right. you end your movie. <laughs> yeah, we should at least have one more band montage, right, where they're celebrating playing on stage because they killed all the ninjas. Yeah, we his dad. The his dad goes to the show, and man, he gets on stage and breaks some boards with his head. <laughs> His dad's like, you know, back in my day, I played a little guitar as well. And then new band member. Oh, he, he pulls a Howard the Duck on him, right? Gets up on stage and just starts tearing it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I think we just wrote part two, man. Man. I, I mean, I think there's enough room, yeah, to, to fit a bunch of stuff in a sequel. We, we'll, we'll call it Miami. We'll call it Miami Reconnection. Or Miami Reconnection. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they just moved to the next time. Next town, maybe or- Orlando connection. <laughs> Orlando, Tampa Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, this movie is basically what you call a so bad it's good movie. Um, mm-hmm. This movie was considered lost for a long time, and 
I did a little research on this, and actually we talked about it when we did it on Short Bus, too, but kind of what happened was this was picked up by Alamo Draft House. And if you're not familiar with that, they're a a company in, in that basically have movie theaters, and they show old grindhouse movies and stuff like that, hard-to-find flicks. One of the guys that worked there bought a copy of this movie on eBay for 50 bucks, and nobody had even heard of the thing. They picked it up, he watched it, and was just blown away by this lost movie, started showing trailers for it at the draft house, and people kept saying, we want to see this movie, we want to see this movie. They actually ended up buying the rights to that movie, re-releasing it, through their own company and showing it and now it's one of those refound movies that's kind of had a second life that's actually more popular now than when it came out um it's definitely that so bad it's good scenario with this one yeah it's almost like a second life cult movie because it wasn't a cult movie Right. To begin with, but after it's got its second life, now it's kind of become one of those movies where, like, if you've seen it, you want to show other people. Yeah, it is definitely a party movie. This is one that you can throw on, and and if people are sitting around just chilling out watching it, you're going to have an absolute blast with this one because the action's good enough, the songs are catchy enough. The acting is terrible, but it, it has its own charm to it, man. And I think uh, you and I are probably a lot alike on this. I like a good, bad movie when it's not trying to be bad. You know, mm-hmm. I can't stand the ones that are trying to make a bad movie. This is just, you know, they were making a movie. They didn't know it was bad. And uh, Yeah, exactly. The main character, like I said, you know, his, his he pumped the majority of the money into this. And they said it cost cost close to a million bucks to make this thing back in the day. And he said after he showed it to like some of his Taekwondo students, they were like, "Yeah, this is pretty much trash. You don't need to release this." <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, well, I, I guess the code of martial arts is to be honest. <laughs> sure, you know. <laughs> well, man, you got any any final thoughts on this flick, man? Ah oh, man, I mean, for those that listen to this and their 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 interest is peaked, I would. It is streaming on Tubi right now for free. Tubi, I don't yeah. know how much Tubi's got brought up with your listeners before, but it's a free app. Uh, yeah, you do. You have to deal with ads, you know, what every half hour or so, but it's not. It's not over the top amount of ads, so that's a good way to catch it for free. And I'm, uh, like you said, I think it has been like a release now. So if you watch it and you like it, it's out there to get. But I agree with everything you say. It's a great party movie. It's a great uh, first timer movie. Anyone who does commentary shows, it would make a great episode, uh, commentary episode. Um, but yeah, it, throw it on on a Saturday night. I think it's a good marathon movie too. Knock back a few. Uh, with your buddies and throw this on in like the middle of a movie marathon and uh, I think it get, it gets the job done if you go into it kind of knowing the type of movie to expect I think it hits all those notes perfectly yep. yeah that's that's a great point yeah so uh, again uh, people that's been listening to this show you you know that these movies that I love are not necessarily Great A movies, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we, we we just we, we we cover some crappy ones, and I wouldn't stare you wrong, though, man. If there's some merit to it, I'm going to tell you about it. Is this a great movie? Absolutely not. Is it a fun movie? Hell yes, it's a fun movie. <laughs> if if you want a movie where you're going to be laughing throughout it when you probably weren't meant to laugh. like you it wasn't designed for you to laugh but you enjoy that kind of thing this is yeah. definitely up your alley <laughs> yeah and like we were saying through the whole thing just how sporadic it jumps from one thing to the other and there's things that don't make any sense whatsoever but it doesn't matter because this movie kind of floats like that it doesn't have to make sense because we're all orphans well cool man i tell you what i want you to go ahead and kind of tell everybody where they can find all your shows at what you got coming up all that kind of good stuff man all right cool well um if 
If any of your listeners have been listening to my stuff, they know I was previous on Horophilia Network for years. Uh, Horophilia, Jason decided to uh, end the network, just became too much for him and his stage of life. So we just recently switched over to Dark Discussions Network. Uh, the main show, No More Room in Hell, can be found there. Uh, we, Our latest episode, we did Tokyo Zombie and Executive uh, Koala. Those are pretty out there movies if, if you've never heard of them. <laughs> uh, Fresh Cuts is the side cast to that where we actually cover new releases on that. And the next episode coming up on that is going to be on The Dark and the Wicked. And then, Ricky, you also mentioned Burning for Springwood where we cover Freddy's Nightmares. So we're approaching the end of the first season of that. So if any of that stuff sounds interesting to you, um, that one, or actually, Burning for Spring World itself can be found on Legion. Yeah, so how many seasons is there of, of Freddy's Nightmares? Uh, there's two seasons, and each one has about 20 ish episodes. We are, we just covered episode 17 and 18 of season one, so we're right at the end of season one, and then we'll get into season two, and then maybe. Maybe after it's it's kind of a sporadic show, you know. It's for uh, for the three of us. It's not our main shows by any means. So we kind of go through periods where like we might record like two three episodes within a couple of weeks and then not do it for a while just because of our schedules. But there's enough out there now, or there's an, uh, enough episodes out there now that if it is interesting to anyone, but they'll have uh, some good listening for a while. Like I said, I mean, I, I go back quite a few different shows you know with you being involved and stuff and this is kind of a milestone man it's 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 about time we get to to do something together but like i said earlier i never would have dreamed it'd been this movie i thought yeah man we'll do who knows piranha or something yeah miami connection <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely man trust me i i, I love these man. kind of movies i, I I'm, yeah. I'm sure i'll eventually be back once uh once you start getting more people on more often, just let me know, oh, yeah. man. It's a blast. Yeah, go ahead and be picking uh, what you want to do next. I'm I'm game, man. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, hey, I appreciate it, man. It's been an absolute blast, dude. Yeah, man. It, it helps that the movie it was it was a fun one. That that always does help. Yeah. So, folks, go out there, go to Tubi, check it out, go buy you a copy of it. You won't be disappointed. We will see you next time. Adios.